Excellent. Right, so, what am I going to talk about? Right, yeah, so, first thing I want to, I'm speaking, uh, first of all, I want to introduce you to the 2022 conference edition, which is going to be available to you very soon. What it is, hold on, my clicker's not clicking. Okay. Basically what it is, it was obviously looking at this, something that I started 20 years ago. That's clearly not correct. I've had some ideas, I've been noodling with some ideas, not just my ideas, some things that are, have been come out of some project plans that we, ha that we have, you know, some ideas that we have internally of things that we want to do, some things that we have definite uh, versions that we want to put them in, some things that they're just ideas and let's think about it and then decide later whether it's, gonna, whether it's got legs and we can put it in an interpreter. Some of these project plans are very vague. They say such and such a thing could be better. Um, you know, which gives me a lot of scope to do some noodling to see uh, what we might be able to do. This is not just me going off on a wild goose chase and having crazy ideas. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of that. But some of this is, you know, has come from conversations with colleagues um, and, and, and customers. So, you know, hopefully it's not just too, all too wacky. Um, you will be able to download it now from this URL or maybe in a couple of hours. Um, now? Excellent, now. So you can download it from there. Um, I'll present this URL again later. And Andy's got some USB sticks, which I've got it on as well. Um, the version I'm going to be demonstrating over the next two or three days is a little bit different. It's probably five days younger than the one that, that Andy's got. I, I, I keep having ideas. I keep thinking, oh, this could be a little bit better. And what actually happens is I actually make it a little bit worse. So I have to spend longer on it to undo that and then actually make it a little bit better. Um, lots of waking up at four o'clock in the morning with good ideas. It's not, it's not good for anybody. Uh, but we'll update the conference edition going forward. So hopefully fairly soon after, after this week, uh, what's available for you to download there will be more up to date. And I would love it if you could download it, use it. Once we get to tomorrow evening, you'll have a much stronger idea about what's in it and what I mean by try it and use it. I'm speaking, oh yeah, no, a couple of notes of warnings about this. The conference edition is based on 19.0, which of course you haven't got. Um, so the fact that it's not compatible with 19.0 will not worry you one iota. But of course the uh, workspaces aren't going to be compatible with 18.2, which you might have. Um, please don't use it for anything important. Please don't try and use it for um, workshops this week. It should install as a completely self-contained thing. It doesn't do any change, any file associations. Uh, it won't have any overlap with registry entries for 18.2 or 19, so it should be, uh, should's doing a lot of heavy lifting there, but it should be completely isolated from your 18.2s and 19s and everything else. I'm going to be talking three times this week using the conference edition. Um, I have intriguingly named these uh, uh, presentations with things that tell you nothing. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the past, that's now, okay. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about the present. Um, this one's a game changer. If you uh, can only see one of these things, come to that one. By which I mean, don't be here now. Uh, <laughs> be here this afternoon. And then on Tuesday, I'm going to talk about the future. One way or another. Okay. Um, these three things vary from being um, useful but largely mundane. I honestly think this might be a game changer for many of you. Uh, and this is just blue sky, seat your pants, let's just play around and see what we can do. But this morning and now I want to talk about the past. And specifically what I want to talk about is the things you did in the past, your session lock. The conference edition includes some extensions, some changes to how we manage the session lock in the interpreter. Now, this is driven from some requirements we have, which I sort of mentioned last year in, in one of the online conferences, uh, about some problems we have when we're doing hash bang scripting, uh, you know, where you're running APL from a, from a terminal, um, and we have issues with connecting the ride debugger to that so that you can debug your hash bang script. And fundamentally, oh, I've got a couple of slides where basically I said, um, it's difficult, we're working on it. And what I'm presenting now is something useful that's basically just fallen out of that work that we were doing to, to improve the debugging of, of things that are running in a, in a terminal. 
And I made the point a year ago that there's a whole lot of I.O. going on. And I did a bad job of explaining what that I.O. was 12 months ago. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do it again and do another bad job of explaining what all those different types of I.O. are. But hopefully it'll be a bit better than it was. What I'm talking about is when we want to write information to the dialog session, okay, typically when you're running code, sorry, typically when you're developing code, but often when you're running code. And there may be many different types of output that ends up in the session. So, for example, default output, you just type 2 plus 2 and something pops in the session. Or you have 2 plus 2 in your function and it pops out in the session. That's a type of output. Quad output, of course, you might do quad gets 2 plus 2. You know, that conceptually is a different sort of output. You might have quote quad output, again, conceptually different. And there's things like, okay, you might get lines of output because an error has happened in your APL code. Uh, there may be output that the interpreter traditionally would have sent to std err if you're running on a, on a Unix system. Maybe output from system commands is something that we want to treat differently sometimes. Uh, output that we might send to the status window. That's a type of output that, that will come from, from your code. And there's a few other bits and pieces of output that, uh, that we might generate in our program. And then in the other direction, of course, we've got places where this output we, where we want this output to go. And typically, you know, it will be to your local session. Okay? But if you're connected via ride, you'd want this output to go to the remote session, to the ride session. Um, or, as I say, some of this stuff goes in that status window GUI that pops up on the Windows interpreter. Or if we're running uh, as hashbang scripting in a Linux terminal, you've got std in, std out, and std error, and so on. Okay. Another environment that we might be running in, we might be an interpreter that's embedded inside a .NET application. As, as Morton mentioned, we can export APL as a .NET assembly, and that can be called by C Sharp or anything else. That APL code, when it's running, might have output, and we might want to say, we want that output to go to something that's listening at the .NET side. So basically, we've got this matrix of, oh, uh, so, right, yeah. so if we're typically ru we're running with a Windows session, this is where your output goes. Okay. If we're running with Hashbang scripting, this is where your output may go to. Okay. When we're Hashbang scripting, we might want to dynamically switch to debugging with ride. So this is where our, I our output is. Then we want to go back to the Hashbang. And it's this dynamic changing of stuff that was difficult for us in the interpreter. Something else uh, you might want to do is you might want to say, I don't want my default output to go anywhere. Okay, if you've written a program when you've got programmers that have unintentionally left expressions in their code that spits output out, maybe you want to disable it and say, ignore that, I don't want it to go anywhere. Maybe you don't want your status window output to go anywhere. Okay. Or maybe you want your status window output to appear in the session along with everything else which is relevant to the code that you're running. Um, so there's this matrix of types of output and destinations for output, okay? And there's a similar matrix for input. There, you know, there's quad input, there's default input, there's, there's all sorts of input, and there may be these sort of locations where the input can come from. We're not going to talk about that today. But one of the big jobs then that, that, that I've been working on... Now, okay, so I'll use the word I. I try very hard in presentations to use the word we, because it's a company, we all do things, okay? A lot of this is I, but I want to present it as, as we. So if I mix those words up, just take it in the spirit with which it's intended. Um, so one of the jobs that we had to do in the conference edition was basically refactor a lot of the internals of the interpreter so that when output was happening, rather than specify where it was going, the, inter the source code in the interpreter needed to say why it was going out, and then there would be layers underneath it that would then direct it to the right place. Once we have that, then we can make that dynamic and flexible so that we can, at runtime, change, change where things go. And that then will solve our problem where hashbang scripting, where we want to connect ride to it, and then when ride disconnects, we want to go back to your I.O. being in the terminal exactly as it was before. So. I'm going to demonstrate some of this now. We're not going to worry too much about what's going on uh, in this dimension. We're going to worry mainly about the different types of output. And mainly, we're only going to worry about the different types of output as they interact with your session. Okay. So let me show you what I'm talking about.
I'm probably going to be short, so we, we'll have lots of time for extra coffee. Um, so here is a conference edition session. It looks very much like what you're used to. Now, I've, I'm, gonna, I'm a one-finger typist, which, but fortunately I've got a script, so all I have to do is press F12 lots of times, and hopefully magic will happen. So, this is your conference edition session. Is the font okay? Is everyone at the back, can you, can you read everything? Jolly good. So, different types of output. So the point now is that by the time text gets to the session, the interpreter knows why it got there. Every line in the session will have a tag on it to say, this is why I came out. So that gives us the, uh, the ability now to treat output in the session differently depending on why it got there. Okay, so for example, if I, okay, okay, all this stuff that I put in there to remind, my, remind me to do stuff, start with a new log job. Okay, right, so for example, if we have an error, okay, that's the, of the output type IO APL error. When it gets to the session, we know it's output because there's been an error. We can color it differently. Okay, now, we, in the conference edition, have made the decision to color it in an error color. Now, if this becomes a useful thing, we can make that configurable, and you can be able to switch it on or off, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But, because we know that those lines are now error lines, and we didn't know that before. Okay, but now we know that, and we can do useful stuff. For example, if we load a workspace, we might say, well, actually, I now want my output from system commands to be distinct from output from code that I'm running. And in this instance, it has been decided, aka I decided that, let's make it green. Let's use comment color for this stuff. So if I type paren funds, we see that it's distinct from input, other sorts of input and output. So when you're scanning through your session log, you know, at a quick glance, you can see, well, that block's related to that you know, and other blocks are related to other things. So it's potentially useful. Uh, okay, that's a single line of default output. Um, many of you hopefully are familiar with extended multi-line input, which we introduced, I think, in 18.0 of the interpreter. And this means I can type a naked brace, and I can write a multi-line defun I can give it an argument and run it. Okay, that's something that we had in 18.0. That's convenient. But you'll notice here that there's this bracket uh, indication here to indicate that these lines form some sort of group. Okay, so something we might want to do for default output, especially for specifically for multiple lines of default output, is maybe group them so that we can say, well, this all all of this output was the result of a single expression, and maybe if we have a diamondized statement on the session, the output from that is two different groups. Maybe that's useful, maybe it isn't, but I mean, we know that that's output lines, okay, we know that it's output lines from two distinct bits of output. Is it useful to distinguish that in some way? And, you know, we can talk about that, okay. Um, just going to grab... <coughs> Some, sometimes, yes, so maybe, um, I don't know who said sometimes, but I heard, um, yeah, right. So again, maybe these, a lot of these settings need to be dynamically changeable and so on. But the key thing is, is because of all of that work we did to refactor the internals of how the interpreter does its I.O., all of this information is now available to us at a very high level, and we can make, it's a lot easier to make decisions about what we want to do with it. Quad output. You know, output from your program, let's not annotate that in some, some way. If it's, if it's explicit output from your program, let's not change how that appears in the session. But for default output, maybe we want to highlight it in some way. Or maybe we want to do the other thing. Or maybe we want to highlight this in another way. We can do that. We can make those choices. We've made some choices so far, but they're not necessarily set in stone. But again, just to give you the flavor of the things we might be able to do. I've no idea what's going to come up next. Oh, okay, right. So, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my... I'm going to save my position in my F12 script, and I'm going to do a print off. Oh. Okay. And I'm now going to restart the same interpreter. 
Okay, I'm going to hit F12 again. That's the last thing that I did, so we'll cancel that. So now we're back. Right, so what we've got then is we've got these additional bits of information for each line in the session. What, um, what we've then done, slash I, Yeah, I, yeah, right, so, right, so, so then, so we got that, that additional bits and pieces of information. So what we've done is we've also put that additional information into the session log file that gets saved. Okay, so all of that information is still in our log, which means that I can now go back, 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 and I can get all of the input lines that I made from previously, to pre prior, you know, before I did the print off. And that wasn't something we could do before because we didn't know which lines in the log were input lines. Okay, so that's good. I can also, if we go up through the log, we can see everything that was colored before was colored before. Okay, this, this multiple block of this, this group of code that was an inline default, and I can now just go back up and I can run that again because we've remembered that it was the group in the log. Okay, the line of code that was an error, still shows up as a line of code that was an error. So the, the session log, when you're using it, is richer. We save that to a file. What we save to the file is also richer so that you're, you get a much se more seamless, uh, what's the word, reintroduction, if you like, to your log when you do a print off and you come back in again. So changes made to how we write the session log. Uh, my... Session log is, for this demonstration, is saved in, in this file. So, the uh, session log file uh, in prior versions of Dialog APL was a binary file, made it difficult for us to extend it. If we wanted to change the version, it was, it was difficult. I'm not sure that it was always uh, portable across platforms. Okay, there's some code in there to sort out some ending issues, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, <coughs> that, it was, that, it, that it was doing what it was intended to do. But in the conference edition, the log file is saved as a JSON file. Okay, so again, Morton was saying, how great it is at codes in text files. Okay, well, now it's great because your session log is in the text file. You can commit that, you can search through the appropriate tools. It's in JSON, so we can read it from, from the interpreter using, using the appropriate tools. Uh, we can see what's in it we can see that my log's got 39 lines of code in it. We can, yeah, okay. This is something that I wrote at four o'clock in the morning. Here's, here's a train that gets the first five lines of the log, a few dots, and the last five lines of the log. We can, it's a lot easier for us now to manipulate either from APL the log, because we, it's JSON, we can do whatever we like with it. We could write it out again, we could modify it and write it out again if we wanted to. Um, so, uh, where are we? Right, so, what have we got? We've got a much richer session. We can make it richer if we can decide, you know, what additional annotations we want to put on lines, okay? Maybe there's additional types of output that, that we haven't considered that we can add in that we can distinguish as well. One of the things that I've got in the conference edition at the moment, which I'm not sure is going to last much longer than this, is, uh, is a column, an additional left-hand column here, which includes a glyph that tells us why a line of output has gone out. So we've all, regardless of what additional annotations we've got, we can see, for example, that the greater than tells me that this is output that doesn't really fall into any of the categories that we talked about. Actually, it falls into the I.O. error category because traditionally, your session banner and things like that would go to studer on a Unix system but because we're a window system, Studer gets redirected back to the session. But we know that this is output. I've got this, haven't I? This is output that would have gone to Studer. And we know this is quad output. Um, you know, so this is a, a useful column here. We've got system command output. We've got error output and so on. This is a useful column for, for us when we're debugging, at least, um, so that we can keep track of what's going on. I don't particularly want to see that uh, persist into a, into a released product, mainly because I don't want to have the discussion of how you might configure what these characters are. 
Okay, we could leave it in and say that's, that it is what it is. Um, maybe it's useful to you, to, to you as well. Uh, okay, so I wasn't sure how long that was going to take. So, and that, that was basically the gist of what I wanted to talk about. And I said to myself, if I had some time left, I would demonstrate a little bit more about this dynamic nature of switching where your I.O. goes, because there may be cases in your program or for your own preferences where you want to change where session output goes. Um, right, so there's another I-beam. Oh, no, here's a thing. Right, so here's a function called do something, which, which uh, has got unintended output, and intended output, okay? Something that I explicitly say is output, something else, oh, it's, it, I, I didn't really want that to go out, okay? And we've got 100 I-beam, which for each of the output types we've got tells us where that output is going. Everything's going to the local session except anything that's to do with status is going to the status window, okay? And these are basically some virtual device names that, that we invented. Um, so if we do do something, both our unintended output and our intended output go to the session because everything's going to local session, as we can see here. But I've written some cover functions. We can say my, I, I want my out, I out, uh, default output to not go to the local session. So if I do that and I run do something, that unintended output disappears. So you can toggle it and say, you know what? If I've got programmers that have unintentionally left expressions in, in functions that are spinning things out, Let's just ignore that and pretend it never happened. Um, and we can switch that back on again, and, and it comes out here. Um, I don't know why I picked a .NET example here. Quite a new date type. OK, this is a function that needs arguments. OK, so if I try and run that, I get a domain error in red because we haven't provided any arguments that satisfy the number of arguments that each of the constructors take. This information appears in the status window. Let's clear the status window and now say, I want my status window output not to go to the status window. Okay, so if we do that, then it doesn't go to the status window. Okay. These are the sorts of things that you might want to do. And again, it's really to give you a flavor of how we might extend this so that you've got much finer control over where things go. And again, going back to the point with the hash bang debugging, means when you connect ride to something, we might automatically redirect a bunch of different things to go to ride. Okay, and then when you disconnect right, we can push everything back again to, to as it was. So, you know, the IBM here is exposing something that the interpreter might take advantage of itself. So, um, on the same theme, we can change the, uh, the output to say, well, and I want my status output to go to the local session. So we do that, make the same as the mistake, and that information now appears in the session, which might be better for your workflow. You get the extended information you know, along with the length error or whatever error that's, that's being indicated. Um, or we can, uh, what we're doing now, we're, we're well, we, now we're, um, we're saying, oh, yeah, add status to the status window, so now the output goes to both places. You know, we can, our output can go to both places. It's more difficult to get input from two places, but, I mean, we can figure that out and we can make that work. Um, let's change this back. Let's say I want my status window not to go to the session, but I want it to go to the status window. So we're, we're now back to the default case. We might say, I don't want my default output to go to the session, I want it to go to the status window. So we do that, we do anything. Our unintended output appears here, our intended output appears here. We can, we can plug things in, it's a telephone exchange, we can plug things in and change where they go. And uh, you know, we can do the same thing, we can say, I want our quad output to go to the status window, nothing at all in the session. I mean, it's just, you know, we're not making any rules here about what can go where. I mean, there may be some things that are just plain and gonna work. But if we're going to make it dynamic, hey, let's make it dynamic so that you can plug in those cables wherever you want. And I think what I'm doing here is just winding everything back so that it's as it was. Yeah, I'm just winding everything back so my default output goes to the session, not to the status window. My quad output goes to the session and not to the status window. Uh, and, and that, great, five minutes to go. So that was basically it. So the chain there is... Uh, Refactor a bunch of stuff inside the interpreter that does output so that um, we can do this bit that I showed you at the end. We, we can do a better job of redirecting input and output based on specific circumstances, whether it's specific things that you as developers want, whether you're developing code or running code, or whether it's things that we in the interpreter need to change on the fly because we want to change where our input is coming from so that you can attach to something where input might be coming from a file 
but you want to debug it. So you want to type in ride, and then when you fix the bug, ride goes away, and then your input starts coming in from the file again. It's to address all those sorts of problems. But what happened is, while we were working on that, was this thing just popped out and said, oh, now the session knows more about stuff. What can we do with that? And that can be useful uh, without all the I.O. moving around. And what you might see in 19 is you might see some of this. You might see the session extensions here, but the, the I beams to redirect the I.O. might not be fully formed. And this, that's going to be a theme with all the three presentations I'm doing today, is some of these things might appear in 19, some of these things might appear later, some of these things that might never appear, depending on feedback from everybody. Um, uh, yes, questions, feedback, uh, send me an email, uh, or ask me now. Right. So, as a user, I'm really looking forward to the session extensions. It reminds me, though, of the users who have asked us whether if we could make sure that if you start two APL interpreters, they don't use the same session file automatically, they number them or something. Right. That's, that's certainly something else we could do. It's not something that's currently in the conference edition. Um, but, yes, that's certainly something we could do. do. And just to paraphrase that, there's a frequent frustration that if you start two version 18.2 interpreters, for example, they both read the same session log, and then you do a print off from one, and it writes the log what it did. Then if you do a print off from the second one, it overwrites everything that the first one did, and it's, you may or may not have done those in the order you intended. So the proposal is, is that if you've got your log file set to, I can't remember, you know, my log.dlf, if when a second interpreter starts, that file is in use, then we may be doing mylog.1.dlf so that they remain distinct. It's up to you then to figure out which one went where. Not figure out which one went there, but manage those files afterwards. But that's the idea there. And that's something that we can do too. Andy. Just a practical note. This, um, John's got the URL of where you can download the conference edition from. It is 64-bit Windows only. Sorry, yes, thank you. I should have said that. <clears throat> um, I've got four USB sticks with the uh, uh, installation on it. Uh, should if you don't want to download it. The other thing is, it is a debug interpreter. First of all, we don't guarantee it's he, well, how stable it is. Debug interpreters can generate another form of error you may never have seen before, which is an affirm error. If you get an affirm error, particularly if you can reproduce the affirm error, please talk to me or to Jeff if you're okay with that, because we're always interested in how you manage to get an affirm error, but these are only in debug interpreters. And indeed, you know, email me, and I can punt it at whoever the correct person is, probably me, to deal with it. Um, I was, there was one thing I was going to say. Oh, yes. So, yes, the conference edition is Windows 64-bit Unicode only, uh, only because I didn't want to have to build lots of different versions of it. I don't think I'm going to be showing you anything over the next three days that is specifically tied to Windows. It's just a convenience in what we make available to you very early on. So, um, thank you. Um, we've, not, we've not forgotten anything. Morton finished at 10, I finished at 10.29. We're bang on time. That's, uh, what, a, what a thing, thank you.